we want to just, I just want to stand up um, for a minute, uh, welcome you to this meeting. Um, this is a really important um, meeting for us as we, in the school, Graduate School of Education, feel a deep commitment to trying to affect change and we would like to hear what our colleagues in the field are thinking about the changes that are taking place in the school district of Philadelphia. This is not a, a, a time for torch or for me to talk um, very much, but to offer some broad outlay of what we understand the issues to be and to really <coughs> have you raise questions and engage each other and us in a conversation about um, what the options, what, what the possibilities are for promoting a school district in which um, students and teachers and um, staff folks have the greatest number of opportunities um, for a really impressive and, and positive experience. So one of the things we thought we would do to get the ball rolling is to ask you to just say who you are and why you're here. Or who you are. Uh, or who you are. You can use a fictitious name. Um, that would work as well. But, <laughs> but say it quickly because there are a lot of people. So, you want us to start from up top or down here? Yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we start That's with Katrina? Like yeah. Hi, I'm Katrina Larson. I'm a third year doctoral student in teaching, learning, and curriculum at Penn GSE. And uh, I came to Penn because I am interested in the Department of Education and Learning and Curriculum. I'm Kathleen Riley, and um, I'm about to graduate from the doctoral program in reading, writing, literacy at Penn. Um, and I'm here because I want to learn more about what's happening, and I'm concerned about um, the school district of Philadelphia. Uh, Christopher Deans, I'm a doctoral student in education, culture, and society, and uh, thank you. Uh, Diane Wong, practice professor here at Penn, director of the Philadelphia Writing Project. I'm here because we're navigating, I don't know what, trying to figure out, um, getting contacts with the school district to go through with professional development. And this new system uh, appears that it's going to be quite a challenge, and I'm hoping that you will give some insights into how to navigate the new system. Because that's the one on the entire educator from the school district of Philadelphia. And I'm working with the Philadelphia Writing Project now as co director of professional development. And my concerns and questions will be the same as um, Dr. Walt, just how to navigate and make connections. Um, um, basically, basically, writing and communities. Hi, I'm uh, Lois McGee, and I'm here with the Writing Project as well. I'm a uh, recently retired uh, school administrator, and um, I'm also co-director for professional development with the Writing Project. And I'm here for those reasons to take notes, and because I have a deep interest in what happens uh, to the school district. I'm Kelly McBride. I'm a uh, corporate and foundation relations officer at GSC. I'm new. And also a parent and a city resident, so I'm keenly interested in what happens. I'm Anita Patrick. I live in Patrick Square in South Philly, and I'm a member of the Educational Community for my local civic association. And I'm working on a framework for how to really energize and focus the volunteer energy in the community for the betterment of the public schools. So obviously, this thing's relevant. I'm Katie Spencer, and I'm a second year in ed policy and an intern at the Charter School Office. Um, it getting taught in the public schools. 
Um, I'm Jolly Bruce Christman. I'm a founder of Research for Action and and here uh, I guess in the role of faithful witness. <laughs> <laughs> Having been around the school district of Philadelphia for forty three years. So you've seen it all. <laughs> Not this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lucy Furman. I'm from Texas University, and I'm, I'm here representing an institution that is as interested as Penn is in the achievement of the model and whether there's a shared opportunity for the anchors in this area. I'm Liz Preston-Stoppi, Vice President of the Community Partnerships at the University of the Sciences, and yeah. Great. Uh, my name is Nikki Coy. I'm a teacher at Wake Mastery Charter School. I was in the district uh, as a Teach for America core member. I'm just interested in the role of charter schools as we are these closing public schools. Hello, my name is Associate Director of Teacher Education. I place, I coordinate the elementary program at, at Graduate School of Health and also the early teacher minors for the undergraduate, and I am also a strong person. Lee. Hi, I'm, I'm Lee Marcus. I'm the Director of Community School Student Partnerships here at Penn. Um, I have a vested interest in the worries of my students and the communities that we work with, given this transfer. And you tried to sneak in. And where do you hang out, Anne? At GSE. Oh. I also hang out at Penn Alex University. <laughs> <laughs> you came in as well, right? Have you introduced yourself? Yes, and they also do a master's student policy at GSE. Uh, my name is Emily Locke. I'm a master's student in the TLL program at GSE. And also very interested in this. Okay. I'm Seth Demko. I'm also a master's student in the TLL program, and I'm also a teacher in the district. So, trying to figure out how this will impact me, my colleagues, and my students. Okay. Great. Um, I'm Katie McCabe. I am an urban studies major and a master's in public administration student at Penn. I currently work at University City High School. Um, I'm going to be interning in the Philadelphia Notebook this summer, and last summer I worked for the Recovery School District in New Orleans. So, I'm really <laughs> Elaine Simon, um, for the record, the Urban Studies Program at Penn, and um, like Jolly, I've been involved in the public schools for quite a while, so this is a, a, a chapter that um, I'm kind of hoping might, that more than just the heads that, uh, the distant heads downtown will write. Uh, I, I'm John Puckett at GSC, and I did all, all, all of what you just said, so I've had long involvement in, in this case. Yeah, I'm Christina Alvarez, thanks to Torch, I'm Dr. Christina Alvarez, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, as well as Susan and Leslie, and anyone who taught in the um, big career program. Um, I'm the, I'm the new CEO of the Design Lab Charter Schools, which is a charter management organization looking for opportunity today. I'm Olivia Dreibel, who's a retired school district uh, administrator, and I'm just concerned now. Carolyn? I'm Caroline Watts. I'm a faculty member at the GSE in Applied Psychology and Human Development and in the Teacher Ed Program. I consult to several schools in West Philadelphia. Um, I'm a psychologist and I'm really concerned about Penn stepping up in a bigger way to share resources to, with a district that desperately needs a lot more and to take leadership in the city for getting more action around what we're going to do around 157,000 kids coming to school in September. Don't forget the charter school. 207,000. Hi, I'm Ann Pomerantz. I'm a senior lecturer in the Educational Linguistics program. I work a lot with the TESOL master's students here at Penn. Um, 
I'm really concerned about the district both as an educator but also as a parent. I have two kids in a public school. Um, I've been extremely involved in neighborhood <coughs> work in my neighborhood of Palatine Village working with Drexel University um, to think about community school partnerships. Um, and so I'm deeply concerned about what's going on. Up top for a second, Jill. Hi, I'm Jill Bazelon. Um, I work with Sarah Health Center running the education program for <coughs> five years, and I recently um, started a nonprofit and focused on community development. And I'm really interested um, in thinking about how communities can be a part of um, this process of change and how um, to really engage them in that. In <coughs> Um, I'm Erica Kitzmiller. I'm a student at um, UCS and NGSE and History Department, and I'm just here because I want to hear more about what everybody has to say. That's a bogus answer, Erica. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> Erica has spent a great deal of time hanging out in the new school district of Philadelphia. Um, Ted Domers, I'm a second year doctoral student teaching learning and teacher ed. I'm also getting my principal certificate in the school leadership program, uh, and I hope to make a career working in Philadelphia public schools. Kathy Bo, I'm a second year uh, doctoral student in educational leadership. Um, I'm a recent transplant as of the last two years to Philadelphia, but I'm really interested in learning more about what's happening with the school district. I was a TFA mentor uh, last year to TFA teachers in a number of public schools, and so it's been a great interest to me to learn more about all the key players and what's happening. Uh, Andy Porter, Dean Graduate School of Education. I'm here to learn and to be supported. I'm Francis Rost. I'm the interim director of the teacher education programs here at Penn, and I'm also here two years. So. I'm Susan Lytle. I um, have had a long time interest in the district, uh, former director of the Philadelphia Learning Project. I'm graduating from the 30th class, and that I'd like to figure out a way to still stay involved in the, in the action. My name is Brian Cohen. I'm a <coughs> current teacher in the school of Philadelphia. In my third school in three years, I went to undergrad for urban studies and then for graduate education. And I have already talked with Torch like four years ago about money in the district and want to know more now. Between the two of us, we can figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's a <laughs> Everybody, my name is Oscar Wang. I'm an undergraduate sophomore at Haverford College. Uh, so I think I'm the newest one here, and I hope I'm welcome. Um, yes. And uh, last semester, I actually interned for the public school notebook, and this summer, I'll, I'll be interning for Chairman Ramos at the SRC. Um, and I just want to be able to learn more about um, this entire process um, because I really do think that the district is at a is at a crossroads, and this is a very important moment for um, the entire district in the city of Philadelphia. The notebook has complained to me that you left the notebook for another job. Uh, <laughs> if you weren't paying attention, he is now helping the chair of the SRC. Uh, not <laughs> <about> that. <laughs> but uh, thank you for communicating that. <laughs> I'm not talking to Paul about that. Um, and I'm, I'm Heather Cron, a fifth year um, doctoral student in teaching learning and teacher education. This is my student, Oscar. Um, I'm, I also am an instructor full-time at Bryn Mawr and Haverford and do teacher education and obviously this really matters to me. So. I think we had one person come in a little bit late. There's no hiding back there. Yeah. Yes. I'm not hiding. <laughs> I'm Charlene um, Wilderson and I work for educational nonprofit and I was a mid-career student for Bryn Mawr and graduate So I hope most of you have this piece of paper. And I would like to work briefly off the piece of paper um, because part of our goal is to help you get some sense of what's happening right now <coughs> in the district. And our larger goal is to really try to press the question, um, given the dramatic budget reduction in the district, given the reduction of resources available to it and so on, what is going to be the role of community institutions in supporting kids, teachers, <coughs> schools, and so on? Is, is the district going to be able to survive if that doesn't happen? If there isn't the, all sorts of community outreach in ways that would be rather new and different for the city. Um, I will be editorialized more as I go along here. 
There are actually um, two plans the school district has put forward and one budget. Now, those are the four bullets. I actually have them all here, and if we wanted to take a look at them, I could roll through them for you. But I currently have up the, the blueprint for transforming Philadelphia's public schools. I will refer to this as the BCG plan. Now, why is it the BCG plan? Because BCG is the Boston Consulting Group. They have been retained by the school recovery officer, the superintendent, uh, Thomas Knudsen, to assist the district in developing a plan both to balance its budget and to figure out long-term program directions. So I will expand on the plan in a bit. The academic priorities and CAO reorganization transition proposal are essentially the same thing. You may have a copy of one or the other. Um, this is the plan developed internally by Chief Academic Officer Penny Nixon and a rather extensive group of um, principals, district employees, ad the advocacy community, parents, and so on. I was directly involved in this process. One of the things that was really intriguing about it was that when it began, the perception of it was that it would be an in-house kind of process. Uh, Penny Nixon really made an effort to open it, to invite anybody who wanted to participate to join one or the other of the committees. It's a very detailed plan. It spells out, for example, what the when you take the notion of increased autonomy for principals, what's that mean? So there is a long list of things in the plan that identify autonomies. Some of those autonomies make parents nervous. Some of them are things that principals and parents and teachers think should have happened years ago. Uh, so I'm not here to claim that every dimension of that plan uh, is beyond debate. There's a lot of room for debate around it. But it was generated by a rather extensive community process in a very short time frame. So essentially what happened was that the, and then there's the school district budget, um, and that's then, uh, I mean, if you read today's paper, uh, the, uh, Mr. Knudsen made a presentation on the budget to city council. We don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the budget. I will say this about that. Um, Mr. Knudsen is very forthright in saying that the projected <coughs> deficit right now is about $220 million, plus or minus 100. Um, and the minus 100 could be more than minus 100, depending on other things, um, revenues on uh, state subsidy payments, and on and on and on. So the district is trying to do financial planning while it is also trying to dramatically reorganize the district. And the two things are not running in a coordinated way. So don't get the impression that the reorganization plan and the budget plan are actually the same thing. The budget plan is an attempt to balance the reorganization plans. are two, They're ways of trying to think about how to organize the district. Um, and occasionally, the financial constraints are mentioned in the same sentence, but not all the time. So one of the really challenging issues, both for the public right now, for the organization and for the School Reform Commission, is to figure out how to reconcile the two plans and the budget. And what we are watching right now is a complicated public debate around this question. So when you, if you read in the Sunday and the Monday inquire about the uh, about the community meeting at Bethel AME Church last Sunday night. That meeting was in response to an emergent community concern about the two plans. And a concern that one plan is taking the district in one direction and the other plan is taking the district in another direction. I will speak specifically to that as we proceed. So let's start with a framing. Um, the School Reform Commission has been very clear about its priorities. And the first several of these are the espoused priorities. The first is to increase high-performing seats and choices. And by that, the, that's code for close low-performing schools, increase the number of seats literally at high-performing schools. In other words, increase the number of te uh, teachers, add classrooms, increase class size, and so on. But if there are high-performing schools, parents should have access to them, and they should not be required to send their kids to low-performing schools. Another dimension of this is to increase the number of charter schools, <coughs> and ostensibly, additional charter schools would be <coughs> created by organizations that have a track record in running effective charter schools. We can debate how many organizations can make that claim another day. Um, the, Corollary is closed low-performing schools, 
and some of those may be converted to charters, others of them may just straight up be closed. Um, so that is part two. There is an agreement and a direction from the School Reform Commission to decentralize. I don't think the School Reform Commission knew exactly what it meant when it said that, but it <laughs> meant give a lot more authority and autonomy to principals and schools and eliminate a lot of the layers of the central office. And the perception, to put it in different words, is if you take an organization like Mastery or any charter school in Philadelphia, they seem to be able to operate without a central office. Why is it that you need this massive central office to administer a set of schools? Now, there are good answers to that question, but um, again, this is a matter of debate. And in its template for thinking this through, the School Reform Commission is clear that it wants a decentralized district. Um, that notion has played out differently in the two plans, and I will expand on that in a moment. Um, the Reform Commission is very concerned about accountability. It's been less clear about what that means, but that means, among other things, keeping kids in school, increasing college access, increasing the number of kids who finish high school within four years, uh, certainly meeting um, state testing requirements and so on. You may or may not be aware that the school district has a report card. It calls the school performance index. It's a fairly complex formula. But the fact of the matter is about 90% of the school's grade is contingent on their state test scores. So there is a substantial question about the degree to which schools can improve their SPI ranking in any way other than to improve state test scores. And principals have made a lot of noise about that to the degree that parents and community people understand the limits of the SPI, there would be pressure to modify their school report card system. If you looked at New York, for example, it gives letter grades to school. It has a somewhat more complicated report card system than Philadelphia does. Um, the, dis the Reform Commission is very clear about downsizing, and it has two constructs. One is to reduce the number of schools. Philadelphia currently has about 70,000. It has a capacity for 70,000 more kids than it has. Um, so, and I might say this differently. I came to Philadelphia in 1970. There were 300,000 kids in the school district. There were 265 schools. In Philadelphia today, there are 150,000 kids on roll, and there are 265 schools. So the number of schools has not declined. Um, now, a lot of schools were way over enrolled and running on shifts in 1972. But the fact is, there are 265 schools plus 50 charter schools. So about 150,000 kids go to the Philadelphia schools. They are spread among the 265. And there are about 50,000 kids in charter schools right now. Um, the other dimension of downsizing is to reduce the administrative staff in, at 440 North Broad Street, which is the administration building. There are currently about 750 <coughs> administrators in <coughs> North Broad Street. The SRC has been adamant that it wants no more than 200. This is a mystical number. <coughs> Nobody, I guarantee no one, can explain to you who the 200 would be. And if you think about what you need to run an organization, how, who do you need in a budget office? Who do you need in purchasing? If you have an accountability office, who has to be there to um, enter numbers and run formulas and maintain things? If you have instructional technology or data management systems, how many people do you need to run that and so on? Um, what do you need in a categorical fund program office and on and on and on? So the question of what you actually need to maintain an organization with a multi-billion dollar budget and Remember that this same operation is managing both the charter schools and the public schools. So you've got 200,000 kids, 10,000, you know, lots of employees. I will say as an ancillary note here, because Leslie is here, that there are four people in the charter school office, which manages an enterprise with 50,000 kids, which is bigger than the Pittsburgh public schools. So if you want to ask yourself, how, it, why is it? The charter schools occasionally have problems with $500,000 leaking out the door. That might be one of the reasons. Obviously, the district wants to balance the budget. The problem is that it can't. As Century Knudsen has said, there is no possible way under the <coughs> sun to balance an FY13. The only way we can stay afloat is short-term borrowing. And the district is very concerned about going into the market 
to look for short-term funds. And the reason is <coughs> interest rates have everything to do with organization stability. And the banks and whomever the funding aid entities might be, I mean, if you were looking at the district right now, it's May 2nd. The balance, the budget is way out of whack. The organization is not reorganized. And there isn't, you know, this would be a fairly high-risk investment. Mr. Knudsen knows that inside out. He is very direct about that publicly. He is trying to say to people, listen, we have to present a, the, at least the appearance of some sort of coordinated and cohesive organization, or there is no way we are going to be able to <coughs> borrow the money we need. So he is painfully aware of the community reaction to the organizational plans and very deeply worried about how you coordinate these so you get some semblance of community support. Because if everybody's fighting with each other, it's pretty hard to say we're good to go. Now you, um, I will move on to re renegotiate employee contracts. You may or may not be aware of this, but the SRC has said directly to its blue collar unions, um, we essentially at the end of this fiscal year are going to terminate your contracts. And unless you agree to radical restructuring of the contracts, we are going to privatize your sections of the district. Working behind that is a parallel message to PFT, which has to renegotiate its contract in a year. So if you're PFT and you're watching the stance the SRC is taking, you are nervous right now. Um, and you are also nervous because when the state reauthor when the state took over Philadelphia, which it did in 2001, remember Philadelphia is the largest takeover district in the country. It gave the SRC the authority to terminate any contract or impose any conditions it wanted on any bargaining group. So when PFT negotiates, it has no leverage at all. Um, and it is acutely aware of that. So the contracts that emerged, particularly the last one, were pretty, there were a lot of concessions from PFT, but it's not surprising that they are making <coughs> concessions. Um, there is obviously an emergent movement in Philadelphia to collect, to form a compact, that is the name of it, that will coordinate across charter schools, the Catholic schools now, and the public schools, and to say, these are our kids. We cannot keep battling with each other. Underneath it all, it's the same money, it's the same parents, it's the same kids. Kids move across all of the school sector very rapidly. Um, so let's figure out how to do this together. I was at a meeting at, on the Penn campus 10 days ago with West Catholic High School, who was really suffering. I mean, here you have a school that has a wonderful reputation in West Philadelphia, but enrollment is declining, they're taking, they're getting hammered by charter schools, they want desperately to get support partnerships. Um, they want a way to coordinate and collaborate with folks in West Philadelphia, and they deserve it. They have a very strong reputation, and they have certainly been among the groups that has made an outreach to the West Philadelphia community. Um, the next book goes without saying. The reduce violence and improve school safety issue is obviously a priority for the district. How you do this when you cut your budget 25% is an interesting question. Um, part of the way you do it is you close violent schools because they're also going to be low performing and you put all the kids in charter schools because they are safe. This again is, becomes a very sticky question because if you know about how, how some of the charter schools run behavior management systems, those who argue about school to prison pipelines might argue that some of the charter schools have invented a behavior management system that is somewhat coercive. So it is, um, and the other problem with the violence issue is, um, I can do this in shorthand, the Inquirer just won a Pulitzer Prize for a long series on violence in the public schools, and <coughs> the most recent superintendent left town with a million dollars in her wallet. This does not improve the district's image in Harrisburg, in Montgomery County, or even in Philadelphia. So when you are trying to take an organization through a, a dramatic reconfiguration and to persuade city council to bite a very tough bullet on a tax increase, whatever they may call it, um, you are making a very hard sell. And if you watch the discourse on the Notebook blog site, there are a lot of people blogging right now who are saying, this district doesn't deserve another dime of mine. There's no way I'm putting up another dough. Meanwhile, the district is trying to hire a superintendent. And those of you who would like to take the job under these conditions <laughs> should submit their resume. <laughs> so, and I mean, 
perhaps there are people, but it, I mean, no, I, this is a very difficult, I don't think it's fair to a new superintendent to walk, ask you to walk into this situation. I mean, anybody who has a sense of direction and leadership and notion about how to do this work would immediately be saddled with closing 40 schools. Forget everything else. There will be an incredible amount of community heat around that. As long as it's not my school, it's okay. But that one, that one piece of the agenda is really going to be problematic and create a lot of challenge. So I'm just curious. It seems like the last thing they want to do, or at least the last thing on their list of priorities, is to get it in the Is that why? Well, not, I mean, again, none of us know. I mean, it's the last thing in your list. My, if I were the SRC right now, I'd probably stall. Because I would let Knudsen take us through at least the financial resolution and maybe through parts of the um, downsizing. But I don't know. Isn't that consistent with coming out and threatening to not open schools and playing these other well, That's part of the money game. That's, right. that's, yeah, I wouldn't. Schools will open in September. I don't know. I would. Wouldn't I just say that he's big thing you have to be around? Pardon? So let's talk a little bit about the difference between the Boston Consulting Group plan and the Chief Academic Officer plan. Turn the page upside down. Column three. Now I've been in the middle of this process for the last couple of months, and this surprised me. This is what truly differentiates the two plans. Both plans talk about networks of schools. <coughs> And the Nixon plan, there is an assumption that the central office has to be downsized and that there will be attendant savings. So if you eliminate regional offices, you downsize the remaining central office, let's say you reduce the number of administrators by 300 and they support staff by an attendant 300 and so on. So there's some savings in administrative cost. Um, and the way in which you imagine schools organizing is that they form networks that are essentially self-governed, where one principal becomes the coordinator and where schools begin to recognize that you've got a wonderful math teacher who has been had a lot of experience in professional development. We're going to have that math teacher do a lot of the professional development work for other schools in our network. You've got four teachers who've been involved in the Philadelphia Writing Project. They're going to take the lead among the set of schools and so on. We've got the schools are going to have to share teaching resources, counseling resources. Also, they're going to have to, principals are going to have to take care of each other and on and on. And one of the intriguing dimensions of this, and it's a concept put forth by David Hargreaves, a British sociologist, is that you sort of shift the accountability framework so that accountability becomes a network concern, not a school-specific <coughs> concern. So you say to school A, you have a strong math performance. We want you to take responsibility for improving math performance in school B and C. And the concern that you are going to demonstrate that all three schools are improving math performance, you no longer are solely responsible for your own students. It doesn't, your own becomes a completely different thing. And it's quite a different way of thinking about school accountability. Um, you, if you want to talk about silo, the ultimate silo, silo is individual schools. Because historically, schools don't think about reciprocal accountability or collective accountability. So it's a really interesting idea. It is not, in that respect, it's not different from the other proposal, the Boston Consulting Group proposal. The difference because the Boston Consulting Group proposal is the same thing. There would be an achievement network accountability, and the accountability would be embedded in a contract written between the School Reform Commission and the operator of the achievement network. Um, so in this case, the accountability is embedded in a contract, and the contract door can be Aspire Charter Schools, as long as they're nonprofit. It can be KIPP. Um, it can be, and this is why USP and Drexel and Penn are in the room, it could be either an individual university or it could be a collection of universities. It could be any nonprofit. The KIPP could decide it wants to go into this business. But the business is not simple. You're going to take 25 schools, K to 12, 
and you are going to accept, at least in the current lit rhetoric, you are going to accept accountability for improving performance in the set of 25 schools with diminished resources, with um, whatever authority emerges in the agreement. And believe me, nobody knows the answers to what the shape of that contract arrangement might be. If you go back to, I'll pick on Kip for a minute, the, but it could be anybody in that territory. The business model that Kip has developed, and Paul Vallis is the leading proponent of this nationally, so I'll pick on Paul Vallis, is that you, um, and you see it in mastery too, you have a teacher cohort that is inexperienced. Nobody is there for more than about three years. And the reason is that you control the salary cost, the benefit cost, and the retirement cost. Young teachers don't have families and don't have kids. Um, they, you require young teachers to invest in their own 401k if they choose to do so. So you can, re you can reduce the teacher salary cost by probably a third, which is where the vigor issue is in the charter school model. So there, so far, there has been a claim that if we do this in Philadelphia, each network will be abide by the contract, the teacher contract. I don't believe that for a minute, because I don't think you can do this in the BCG model and accept the current conditions of the PFT contract. The, the, the reason is that the teacher cost is too high to run the model. Now, you're beginning to get the complexity of this mess, so. What about the costs of these operators? These well, that's one of the things that blew me out, <laughs> because in the BCG model, they, and Knudsen spoke specifically to this in the Sunday inquiry in the interview we did with Kristen Graham. They agreed that there could be up to 18 employees. Where did 18 come from? <laughs> <laughs> Who were the administrative team for any one of these networks. <coughs> so what happened was, and this, I wasn't ready for this one, they transferred the administrative cost in the central office into the eight networks. So I was assuming in the Nixon plan, and it's in the Nixon plan, that there's one of the conditions was a cost saving in the administrative structure. <coughs> but that is not a component of the BCG <coughs> plan. I might say that BCG has wonderful graphics. <laughs> <laughs> I kept going, we would get to this thing. That's, this is a, I mean, this will just, actually, by accident, I wound up at the right page. This is a page Knudsen used when he talks about the budget and the reorganization. Don't count the blocks. But what you've got here, that's where we are. So there, the idea is there are charter management organizations. This would be master or something. There are standalone charters and there are the district schools. And there is, central office and regional offices and blah, blah, blah. In this model, there are charter management organizations. Um, there are some remaining school district facilities. I, I'll ask the question because I don't know the answer. And then there are these eight achievement networks, each with about 25 schools. Now, here's the mathematics. You cut out 64 schools, so now we're down to 200. And you assume 25 schools in each of eight networks, and now you've got 200. So there's the organization. Mm -hmm. What I don't get is where did Central go? Mm -hmm. um, by which I mean Penn Alexander, Girls High, Master Mass LA, and so on. One of the notions is that you put them, and this emerged in the, the Chief Academic Officer version of the plan, one of the deep concerns parents had was don't put all of old performing schools in a group with no strong schools in the pile. That's not, that is not an equitable resolution. So if you look, the, I, I actually can show it to you if you wanted to see it. But in Nixon's plan, every one of the um, networks has at least one high-performing and usually several high-performing schools allocated to it. In, in the other plan, the eight-network plan, nobody's identified what the schools are. 
and whether they would be geographic or they would be dispersed. They could be either one. Because hypothetically, you go into the market and one vendor wants to operate STEM schools all over the city, and a group of STEM related schools jump up and say, that's fabulous, we're in. Um, and you know, nobody wants North Philadelphia. So in fact, I mean, I, I've been talking to folks at Temple about whether they're ready to do this. President's leaving, the provost is retiring, the dean of the School of Education is interim, and the chair of the ed leadership there is um, retired. Who is going to make the decision for Temple to accept responsibility for working with 25 schools in Philadelphia? The school is in the state. Yeah. So I think we're about there. You got the picture? Yeah. That's why we're here. Okay. So the achievement networks, are you just, this is BCG's travel? Yes. Okay. So in their view, is it that it would only be Philadelphia's district schools that the achievement networks would manage versus the charter management? Anything that became a charter would automatically be operated by yeah. I, um, here's the way I read this. It makes the SRC's job somewhat simple. Because the, the, the accountability is eight of these, and however many of these there are. And as to where standalone charters fit, I don't know. Torch, they said that that little box of six, remember last week? Yeah. That should be, in fact, all of the independent charter schools. Because okay. they are all on their right. own, being their own manager. I don't think there's, so we would agree there's no movement to try to aggregate independent charter schools. But it does create a management question for the office it Leslie is in. How do you, how do you monitor, I mean the first kid, thing you need is audit capacity, I know that's the wrong one. But you've got to know how many kids are there and where the money is. Um, then there's the performance issues. So I don't know. <laughs> Well, heck, so numbers I'm thinking of for, for students because the beginning of the year is always a fluctuating number of students going back and forth deciding, okay, I like this school, I don't like that school. In one school district, that's not easy, but easier. With achievement networks, what happens if a kid moves? Well, that, that question has been very much debated by parents and principals and teachers because, and it by Knutza, because what happens in a large organization is if 500 kids move to charter schools, they're from all over the district, and you cannot reduce cost. If five kids leave my school, it doesn't cost any less to run my school. That is one of the real problems the district's been having as kids transfer from the, you know, the district schools to charter schools. There is not a, the two lines are not parallel. This is not the first time the district has had some calamitous right. money problem. It's the current time. And the public explanation is partly the charter school takeout and partly that um, the previous superintendent way overspent um, what she had. She essentially used stimulus funding to pay for operating costs. And um, with the, I mean, if, Everybody knew this, but nobody stepped in the way of it. That as soon as the stimulus funding disappeared, the district would have to go through a fairly substantial reduction. So you add on a couple of other factors, and you've got the explanation for the current budget situation. Leslie, you want to? Yeah, and I just wanted to add, when we say that kids are going to charter schools, that includes cyber charters as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the school, my office is the authorizer for the 80 bricks and mortar charter schools that are in the city of Philadelphia, but the per pupil funding also goes to the cyber charters. I don't know how many yeah, Actually, on CB after class, anybody who wants to make money in a hurry <laughs> can open a Philadelphia-based cyber charter school. Why the district hasn't done this completely eludes me. For real. 
The four surrounding counties, Bucks, Montgomery, Delaware, and Chester, created a cyber charter school for exactly that reason, because they were getting zapped by a couple of the other charter schools. Um, at last night's SRC meeting, Tim Reynolds yeah. talked very, uh, Reynolds talked very openly, the, or sorry, uh, the recovery officer continues to talk very openly about halting the, uh, any plans for any future Promise Academies, but not openly about more Renaissance charters. Wouldn't that draw more resources away from the achievement networks if they keep on converting? The question is, what happens, we, we'll leave Promise Academies aside, that's pretty confusing stuff. But this idea of Renaissance charter schools essentially means that you take a school like Gratz and you decide based on its performance in school safety and so on that um, it is not salvageable by the district and therefore you convert it to a charter and in the instance of Gratz you find a charter management organization to run it, so a mastery runs Gratz. The question is how much additional funding you pump in and what that buys. And the district to this point has overfunded Renaissance charters, at least in the short term. And organizations like Mastery have been very effective at raising outside support. Um, so, you know, when Mastery starts, when Mastery takes over a new school, it's not unusual for them to spend a million dollars or more on paint up, fix up, <coughs> etc. stuff, just to make the place look good. Let alone add technology and on and on. So, and for parents, I mean, you know, the school looks better. There are more school police around. The place feels kids aren't getting, you know, they're afraid to go to school in the morning and so on. So I'm not trying to say this is, uh, you know, that the Renaissance Charters is a lousy solution. You know, the SRC is trying to be sensitive to the parent, the parent concern. Um, I'm you know, going back to Let's keep in mind that a lot of people in the room know at least as much about this stuff as the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this, this question is a deliberate, deliberation question for everybody in the room, starting kind of with the goal of the meeting was to bring groups and individuals together to think about how community institutions can enter. And I guess I'm wondering what are the new set of assumptions, reasons for community institutions to enter this playground when, you know, eight years ago, under the diverse provider model, where community institutions would be dealing with many less students. Um, you know, we didn't see a lot of positive results. That's not to say that good things didn't, some good things didn't happen, but it certainly was not a transformative um, solution. And so, <laughs> so what, is my what is, what is new? Why, why would Penn, for example, Hmm. Jump into this, um, and why would the why would the public want to jump into this? What what new is that play here um, for this? You go number one on this one. And well, I mean, I'm not just no, no. I hear that. Like that. That's it's a question for the room. It is, it is a question. It's, you know, it's what we're all <laughs> thinking, it's what we're all thinking about. And I, I, don't, I, you know, I, I'm not even sure how the SRC thinks or BCG or any of the other people who are thinking about this are really coming to grips with that reality of our city. I think it is, a it is a question that we would like the whole room to engage in. Part of the reason that we're here today is because this, did, this issue did come up for us as a faculty in the Graduate School of Education. And there is a matter of you know, how we serve and, and how we make ourselves present. Um, how to exactly do that with 
what possibilities for the school district and for the children and families whom we care about, something we're trying to figure out, and that's why we're here. I don't think we have an answer for that, but I do think that there are some ways in which we begin to, to think about the alliances that we have and the relationships we talked about, the science, um, University of the Sciences and Drexel and doing some, framing this work differently um, than it has in the past. But I would actually ask the, the audience to think through with us, that's why we're here actually, <laughs> to think through with us what that answer might be. Not okay, so Sean. that as a rhetorical question, but both Vivian and I would both say absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's right. subsequent contract to assist with the implementation. Whatever the implementation, if you can tell me what the implementation is, then okay. Um, back up to the top, yeah. But isn't the issue that the district is dead in the water? Right? Yeah. So the politicians are not going to fund it. This is what people think nationally should happen. And I mean, it's the issue that we do the best with what we have left. I mean, no one takes any credit in the, in the district on a statewide level. They're not going to put any money into it. Obama and the and school reform people think this is the way to go, right? which is to bring in outside nonprofits and privatize education. I mean, I don't know if that's a good idea. I mean, I, I too am I'm, I'm among the paranoid, but <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, what, what is, I don't know, maybe people here well, have a better. Thank point. you for keeping us on point. <laughs> Mike? I'm just a visitor here in Chile, so. Um, right. <laughs> but this, this looks a lot like the, uh, going back to the future in New York, uh, since we adopted this kind of portfolio thing. And I'm not sure why there's the evidence is. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that this is the route that needs to happen. At least I wouldn't say the evidence that makes a strong argument in that direction. My question for Chile, though, is, uh, is whether or not there is enough room, you think, and given the, the straits in which the district finds itself, for a very different kind of a vision to be something that Penn says we're willing to come to the table that needs to look very different. I would put out my own by something that would be much more place-based 
relative mm -hmm. to West Philly to say, look, we can bring, we can come across the spectrum for what we're trying to do. We can bring in work from all sorts of right. different parts of the university to address what we learn, and to be a good partner in that. Yeah. But this is a different approach. I don't know if that, you know, sometimes there's opportunity when there's desperation. <laughs> there is a, there's a different picture of how this might turn out. Thank you for the caution from the Upper East Side, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there, there are two sets of questions here. I mean, one, one thing I hear you saying is, you know, how should we do it or why should we do it? And to me, it's much easier to answer the why than the how. And I don't know that this is necessarily the how, but I'm with you, is that something ha is happening. It's going to happen. And to me, there's a moral, social, communal imperative for the city and the city's institutions to come up with ways of participating in this process. And it does make sense to me not to think about taking the whole city at once, but to almost model, to say, we'll take this part, we'll take our community together with Drexel, USP, come up with something that seems reasonable and model a way of partnering that's constructive and engaged, that's good for our institution and good for the city. Mm -hmm. And that can help other people think about how to do that similarly in other parts of the I city. I feel like that's this not is scalable is because you guys have such tremendous resources here. South Philly, what's the pattern? Actually, that question came up during the, um, the chief academic officer Nixon question with parents in the room who are from North Philly. And they said, we understand it, it's not equitable, but it's how it is. And um, we will solve the problem in our community in ways that work for us. So it may be communities of faith, it may be the fire department down the street. Maybe hospitals. It could be hospitals, it could, it, and for that matter, it can be, uh, you know, Disney Studios or something. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be partnerships with places that are in our neighborhood. Ideally, that's where we start. But we're going to have to think in a larger scale if we're going to solve the problem. So they, that was an issue, but that was an issue people felt they were just going to have to accept. Yeah, although the problem with that is that the, the, the question, and Persia and I were at a meeting in the district last week where some of these libraries have gone up very successfully. Where's the expertise <coughs> that any of us have in running libraries? We've ample remembered that we had at two schools in the AMO days, Kevin had five, and it was incredibly hard to do. And we at Drexel also did the the district to take on the machine network. And, and I think the real question is, what kind of expertise does it take to manage and improve two to 25 schools? None of us. I mean, the university's mission is an instruction mission. And none of us, I think, have the capacity to actually be full-time school managers, and we don't have the expertise. So what's the framing of knowledge? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can imagine setting up some nonprofit entity that was co-owned by the three universities that essentially hired a management staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I so make, we I'm making, I, I, to somebody I, to do they, it. and they might be allied with, you know, they could be on the payroll of one or another of the institutions. I don't even know what it looks like, but I would agree with you that um, it, it probably wouldn't work to have people who were employees of the organization, of any one of the three places, as the people operating this enterprise. We've learned too much from the EMO game already. Elaine, I think we're going to do that. I don't see anything in what I've been hearing that guarantees that you're going to be able to do a geographic that, that, is, that anything is based on geography. I mean, I don't know. All I can it tell you. It sounds to me that if you've got no. this choice system, you've got this, you know, the charters, that number one, people are going to be moving all around the city. So I don't know what geography is going to mean. And number two, you're going to have this incredible sorting speed that's, that's, that's going to, if there is a geographic component to it, that the universities, like let's say just take West Philadelphia, for example, are going to be dealing with, then, you know, those schools that are going to be the ones in which kids, parents haven't chosen or tried to get into the other schools are going to be the most difficult 
what? places to work with. So you're, you're describing the market, which of course is I'm the model. The market, it's, right. The market lurks right behind that screen there. Right? So, you know, I mean, I guess you were saying like Penny Nixon was trying to distribute the schools. I don't, I don't understand no, that. No, that wasn't her decision. I was saying that there were parents and advocates in the room who were concerned that there be mm -hmm. some semi-equitable allocation of schools among the networks in the network in the model she was creating. Right, but this isn't guaranteed. No, no. And I will say a, a permutation of what you're saying and is to flip the paradigm here. The SRC wants desperately for Penn, Drexel, USP to take the front on this. Call some shots. And that's part of the question right now. Are the you could almost dictate the terms, but do you want to dictate the terms? Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it isn't like they know how to run, you know, this model of partnership either. I don't know if anybody does. I mean, Mike pays attention to this stuff. Chicago doesn't have a model like this. New Orleans has kissed their school district goodbye. And one of a comparable city is Detroit. Yeah, and Detroit's kissing its district it goodbye is. too. That's why we're. I mean, that's why we're here. We are deeply concerned that the dominoes have gone New Orleans, Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and that the temptation, you don't have to go too far beyond the Philadelphia city limits to say, who gives a shit about that place? Um, especially in Harrisburg, and to say those kids don't deserve it. That's why I mentioned the violence series in the Enquirer. Mm -hmm. Public perception is these kids don't deserve anything. That's right. And that's why this becomes a public leadership and civic engagement matter. And the mayor has got to take the front and Pedro Ramos. I mean, between the two of them, this is, and it's why the partnership thing is going to have to be driven in the political sector. Well, there are learning institutions, I think, all over the city that, um, that would partner um, to do this because their mission really is to educate our, our students. And they rely so much on contacts with the school district. And right now, places like the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, the National Museum of Jewish American History, they're all clamoring to get into classrooms and into schools and to work with kids. And I think they need someone to pull that piece yeah. together. Well, and they need to reimagine, too, because it isn't just get into it. Yeah, Maybe the school is now in the museum. Right. Uh, I, 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 you are absolutely together. right. Part of this is the sort of inventory of who could do this and then really strong arming people to think about doing it. And I think the, the management of this could be separated from the resource element. Yes. In a way that that's part of the partnership element. Well, a lot of principals say, listen, you let us loose and we'll do the partnership building because we've got a lot of them already and we will make them work and we will share them too. Okay. Yes. I'm yeah. trying to get a sense of what the process and timeline is where this is on the decision. What would you like it to be? My my take for they've got to resolve the budget. But they can't. So the <laughs> is that my phone? <laughs> my phone never rings. I'm the only person who has my phone number is yes, sir. I'm <laughs> I think the, if I were guessing, the, the way the Knudsen is imagining the timetable right now is to do the CAO plan for next school year, because they're not ready to do the eight network plan. You know, there's way too much hard thinking and negotiating. There's, not, there's nobody around who's ready to do it. Even in Knudsen's, in the article Sunday, he runs through the list, and most people say, ah. <laughs> I mean, the KIPP says, rah, you know, we're sort of in the business, but we've never done a set of schools in the city. That's not how we operate. We create standalone charter schools, and they affiliate with our national network. That's a very different model than the one that the SOC is presuming. So this first step would probably be, I'm guessing, to do the CAO plan. And with the presumption that that will roll into the next iteration in the following year. Now, if you don't have any of these plans and you want them, they're available both on the notebook and that website, and I can send them to you too. Right. Yeah. 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 Ye
course, you know, the other thing that we're thinking about is looking across Philadelphia and looking at how many models we actually have of successfully turning around low courses. And I think just about the only model <laughs> we have is Mastery in the Spira. I mean, it's, and they have done it in a particular way. So in thinking about, I mean, the goal of these achievement networks is to turn around multiple <coughs> poorly performing schools, with the exception of Ellis Town Center, Powell, and a couple, a handful of schools that are okay. Now, given that we don't have any models to be able to do that, even with the additional funds, the idea that an administrative structure could be responsible for turning around 25 schools, again, there's, there's no processes. And there's no model, and there certainly is no ability for universities who have a mission to do something entirely different to get into that detail. And I, I think you're reminding me of something. It isn't that the SRC doesn't want this to work. You know, uh, they would like <laughs> schools to be better. Um, you know, it, it isn't that they're trying to parcel out money to people driving down the road or something. That, you know. But they're desperate for workable models, given the set of conditions they're trying to confront right now. So this is not a simple problem. Johannic? Yeah, we're, we're, okay. we're somewhere back up there. Not Gomer. Okay, somebody else wanted to say something? <laughs> sorry, sorry. We're in true, OK. We're working on brand new. So forgive me for being ridiculously idealistic, but <laughs> My first teaching, I was at West Philadelphia High School, and we were put under the Renaissance night, I'll call it, uh, and there was this idea of this innovation plan as one of the Renaissance models, and I had not like a huge connection with it, but my, my staff put together a plan, tried to partner with Johns Hopkins and talent development that was agreed upon by the School Advisory Council, and almost got through, and then there was some issues, and it didn't, it became a promise <laughs> academy, um, and I got forced out, but... Like that idea of teacher leadership, I love, and I think <coughs> creates bonds in the community as well. Because teachers will go out and talk with their students and their parents. And um, I'm part of a, a group right now that's reading this document that's coming out of the Department of Ed called the Respect Document, trying to create an idea of teacher leadership out of the community. So that I feel like this would be a perfect opportunity. Why couldn't teachers develop some model within their school, between schools? I would love to be a part of that. No one's asked me to be a part of that. Extensively, that's part of the, that's the intent here on the Nixon side of the equation. Mm -hmm. And that's what I kind of saw. My principal introduced yeah. that plan to us during special Weather last week. And I saw, oh, well, what if we got in contact with all the feeder schools more often and, and talk with them and <laughs> ran professional development with them so that we knew who would be coming in, they'd be prepared for us already. That was one. What were the other two? You said there were three things that were in your head. Oh, no, I was idealistic things. <laughs> there's many, there's a lot of stuff. That was most of some I was just going to say, also a teacher, Wesley High. Um, so the thing that I've been deeply involved with the Renaissance process is rolled out every year. And um, they have consistently put it back to teachers that there's no track record of success because we work in the failing schools, so we don't have a track record of success. Um, and two things that stuck out to me is one, they're knocking apparently on Penn's door, um, and you know, institution store, where's their track record of success? I don't, you know. And then um, if the teachers, <laughs> I mean, they've been good at doing universities, but that's not the same. Um, and just another example, to me, it just seems like the district does not want teacher leadership as evidence most recently by the creation uh, proposal that teachers to do a teacher-led turnaround, and that was. I think that's a not. very compelling point, and it's sort of the issue you're raising. Um, <coughs> you know, why? It, and I think talent development was a nice cover for that because there are certain school reform models that actually build around teacher engagement, teacher leadership, and so on. It's too bad that that didn't happen mm -hmm. because if between the two, I mean. That may be one of the outs. I don't know. You find a partner that has some ideological compatibility with you, and that's where you go. I mean, I, this is a complicated poker game right now, and you know we're all trying to figure out 
if, you, if, if the end game is to actually create schools that work for kids, and this is the sort of mediating environment, whoa, how do you do that? So, so are you saying that what is really going to happen is that the Nixon plan is going to be in place for a year, and then we're going to switch to BCG? I, they, they've got to do something. Because they've said that, I mean, they, I went, you know, <coughs> it's the downsize central office, it's the eliminate the regional offices, it's the balance of the budget, and so on. And it, the way that the budget gets balanced and its relationship to the plan may be sketchy, but the Nixon plan doesn't cost any money and it doesn't require contracts. You don't have to go out and find vendors to do it. So it's a nice, convenient solution for the now. The, I mean, if it got it to work, well, that's what, that's wouldn't that be wonderful? That, that was sort of, that was part of the discussion. If we can make, you know, now how, how many people have done school turnarounds in one year we can? <laughs> but isn't that part of the assumption that's the problem? Because this assumption that we're going to take these 50,000 low-performing seats and magically turn them around as if kids are a low-performing seat in a vacuum, and that somehow we can just turn that around and that the school I'm in this year is 57% students that are uh, with ESOL services or special ed services. And from the track records of the magnet schools and the charter schools, where are those children going to go? And, and there seems to be, we keep sort of skirting around ideology and equity, and there doesn't seem to be much of that in the discussion. Well, I have a short answer to that, and that is um, I'm afraid what we are seeing is the segmentation of a market. <coughs> The segmentation is the low end of the market, so to speak. So you are, what you're going to see is, and you see it already, schools that have concentrations of disciplined kids, special needs kids, ELL kids, and so on. And, you know, and the district, a lot of the district schools, well, it's what you heard earlier today. The charter schools poach the easiest to manage kids, and they leave the other kids for the rest of the schools. Very ugly solution. Sorry, I, like I said, I teach at Mastery Charters. My seventh year of the organization is my ninth year of teaching, and I'm also in a, a principal certification program. I think what we we need to do then, and I think Mastery actually does a great job of this. I know at my particular school and a lot of our schools, we serve a lot of special needs kids. We have ELL programs, and we try, because we are a public charter, because some of our schools are actually straight neighborhood schools and not a site selection, we don't have an application process for some of our schools, then we need to hold charters to that same standard um, of serving our population instead of private charters or charters that have application processes because those are very separate things and I think um, to paint charters with a really broad brush or to paint high performing charters with a really broad brush is not necessarily fair and we should be looking at best practices of all of these high performing schools to see what we can take what we can implement in achievement networks or public schools, um, or how we can push charters who are taking over schools to be open and keep their doors open to a lot of different well, Thank you for that. That was a very needed statement. And in the CAO plan, there is one of the ideas would be that the networks hopefully would include charters and parochial schools within their geographic regions, partly for the reasons you've just outlined. There are some schools that are doing really good jobs. They have a lot to teach to other schools, and there are a lot of the, if you if we, we get out of this <coughs> charter school public school distinction and say how do we learn from each other, then we'd be in a better place up on top. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the budget though has to follow the kid. I mean, the money has to follow the students. So it can't be just some flat rate for every kid because students with different needs should come with larger budgets, and therefore they be more desired. Wow in some schools because they're getting more money to educate. Well, I signed up for my school finance class on weighted student funding. <laughs> it, underneath it all, it, that's sort of how it has to work with putting those models in. No, no large urban district has done very well at actually making that happen. It makes a lot of sense, but it's not easy to do. Don. 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 Yeah, thanks. Uh, when I look at this, I, I see this colorful abstraction and I'm thinking what, what's missing from the picture uh, and it's, it's the grasping hands of local politicians um, and, and the, that, that was in, in this last phase of reform at least in West Philadelphia was an enormous problem. Well and it's there are a subset of charters where that has obviously been an enormous problem 
but I'm not going to fight over West Philadelphia. Yeah, absolutely. It's not done. And it's the danger of the decentralized <coughs> I don't, um, but I mean, that's part of the question Jolly's posing for us is um, given all of these tensions and conflicting interests, how do you keep the interests of the kids and their parents in the front? And I mean, Knudsen knows that, but his problem is the solve the money problem right now. So he's going to leave with the money solution and not with the child solution, uh, which is what he was hired to do. I can't blame him for that. I mean, they don't solve the money problem. There isn't any other problem to solve. So, so are there good examples uh, at the district level of where uh, the district has gotten itself into probably the same kind of situation in uh, Philadelphia and where and figured out a way to uh, make progress in this problem? And if, if there is, are we looking to those places or not? No, I've tried people in the room on that because there's some yeah. people who pay attention to this. If I were picking it, it'd probably be Long Beach, California, maybe Charlotte, Mecklenburg, but I'm not sure they're as complicated as Philadelphia is. Anne? You have to answer the question first. <laughs> um, you know, okay, they got some money problems. Wait, wait a minute, I'll give, I'll give Andy one more. I would say Chicago is in a somewhat different place, but it's partly because it has a lot stronger business community, corporate headquarters community, foundation community, and so on. And there is a, th I think there's a sense in Chicago that we better try to preserve some reasonable sense of public education. There is not that sort of gravity in Philadelphia that, that holding it all together. We're unique in a lot of other ways in terms of contrast. I mean, Technically, these should look a lot more like Detroit, like I said before. But then there's a whole different set of issues. Detroit doesn't have the resources that, in terms of universities or whatever else, that we have here. Chicago is a much bigger place with a different core of resources and expectations associated with the school. So not to make us so special, but we are unique Absolutely. in you know, our history and, in, and the real and perceived resources that we have. Um, so all we can do is draw some lessons, but I don't think there's anything comparable to right. can train well, back and forth. Yeah, I, I think maybe I misrepresented my idea because I agree, you know, these are, these right. are one off things, so everyone's eat. but I was just I was listening to what we're talking about mm -hmm. and there's just a lot of shared despair. There aren't a lot of revolutionary ideas for how to tag it and I was just wondering, could yeah. we get some recognizing you just can't adopt them and they bring them in and because they work someplace else, they would work here. But just something that would elevate our level of mm -hmm. conversation is where I was going. Well, well, what's a specific next next step? <laughs> Do something more systematic and looking at those various places. Well, and I think you first and foremost would agree that this is sustained long-term okay. work, yeah. that school mm -hmm. improvement is on a curve like wow. this. Yeah. And that the expectation that you can dramatically accelerate that curve is not reasonable, which is part of the policy environment problem. Not to dominate, but I just have one other thought. Maybe some of you saw that uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, I recently wrote about what we called churn, which was just this incredible turnover of a teacher. Different school every year, or even if you're in the same school, maybe a different grade or a different subject. Uh, principals come and go, uh, administrators come and go, even superintendents. I, I did a study of Kansas City. They had, at the period of time that I looked at them, 25 different superintendents in 25 years. So, uh, and I know we do some things that actually exacerbate this churn. I mean, there are things that we actually do by way of policies. And so I just tossed out that we, my colleagues and I, tossed out the hypothesis that everybody recognizes this and everybody says, well, it's a given, but could we imagine not taking it as a given, but actually trying to calm down some of the churn. You know, business says maybe 10% churn is good, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about 37 to 47% churn. And it's hard to feel how to figure out how you could build a professional community in a school with that kind of change. I, I'm not talking about kid change now because there's a lot of that as well, but that, that really may not be as controlled. And I don't know, I'm just tossing it out. Would, there be, would that be just one small dimension that 
Philadelphia could think about taking on. Actually, you might have a problem. We've got two doctoral students at Penn who are exact using the New York City public schools as their research sites to answer that question. And it sort of comes out. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, one of them is Matt Cosman, me to them. And, uh, Either way, Lisa Merrill. But essentially, what they're finding is predictable. Schools that have good principals over a period of time and create favorable working conditions for teachers, retain teachers, and reduce churn, independent of neighborhood. Jane, which is helpful. Yeah. Jane, this is more crazy. We'll stop at. We're going to stop at five thirty. Okay. More crazy grassroots thinking, but sort of plays off of what you're talking about. I mean, if, if we could agree that best change comes from within the school, and we could, as a university or as many universities, do a better job of inventorying all the relationships that we have with teachers, with principals, with communities. I mean, we don't, like, fill up your writing project. We don't coordinate with the Penn Science Teacher Institute. We've got teachers in schools and various places throughout the city that really we need to tie back into some of this reform. I had a teacher who graduated from one of our master's degree programs who contacted me two weeks ago and says, our school is now talking about this whole partnership thing. We'd like to work with Penn. What can we do? And so, I mean, and I don't know how to answer that only to say, let me find out some more information about what we're thinking. Well, I something. hope you heard the answer but to you that. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, not, it's logical, it's most or obvious that we would work geographically in West Philadelphia, or it's, it's obvious that we would work on a subject sort of focus. But maybe there's some other way to sort of tie this vast network of people that we are related to, with whom we have relationships. <coughs> to figure out what the schools want and then what we can do for them. The potential for that yeah. makes Philadelphia special. And we're not, that's right, because we're a big city, but we're a small town. And every time we turn around, we run into somebody who knows somebody else. And, and I, also I our history. I don't that. think we've really exploited the possibility of bringing these relationships. So that's where the network, that was supposed to be the network idea, what you're describing. It got morphed into a management notion rather than a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That collaboration can be used to remap the future. Right. That way we don't have to take this important conclusion to leverage those relationships mm -hmm. to come up with, with a new right hand side of the chart. Can I actually speak to that a little bit? There's uh, something that Philadelphia started in one of the pilot cities across the country called Change by Us, mm -hmm. which is an online social media platform granted for the technology inclined somewhat. But the whole concept is put people who have needs next to people with wants and connect them. So I, as a teacher, went on that site three weeks after it opened, and I said, I need computers in my classroom. The person who runs it, this guy from the city government, contacted me and said, I'll put you in touch with these people. I have laptops in my classroom now, three months later. So that is exactly what we need. People can use that, potentially only, but something like that as a platform to connect the universities, the nonprofits, the hospitals, whoever, faith-based networks, with the schools, with the principals, with the students, so that there's dialogue about that. That whole list, the database, can exist, I think, pretty easily. I think I saw a couple other people who had something they wanted to say. Yeah. And I cut you off. Well, I just wanted to have a wealth of knowledge. What would your right hand side look like? You know, what? what's your backward map from the school? I, I, I wouldn't do it that way. Um, I think the answer is sort of floating around here. Brian's been the most recent to articulate it. It's, Create the space for the networks to form and do everything you can to facilitate them. Um, and ultimately, all that, I mean, I can talk about partnership, blah, 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 but what it really is is networking people who are going to help each other out. I've worked enough in partnership schools to know that they are always personal connections. You can, anything on paper is on paper. But what about the problem that we have, we don't have by and large? We have a lot of new teachers. And if you don't have a strong, if you have a strong principal, you can say to a university, hey, this is what I need. Help me do it. That's one thing. But if universities go into schools and say, hey, we've got these different programs, the school will, will die from that. We, have, we don't have enough principals who know how to use the resources that are available in the city to put together a coherent plan so those resources plug into the classrooms in the right way so that the children achieve it. Wow. And the problem that a lot of schools have, I mean, I was just talking to the school group, 
you know, his problem was that he had 10 programs in there, mm -hmm. and he had no help with his essential problem. And he knew what his problem was, and he didn't have any help with it. So, it, it, and maybe I'm on the cynical side, having been inside schools for a while, but we, if we had strong principals, if we had strong teachers who knew what they needed, who could work together effectively, that would be great. But in fact, we don't. We well, have we have challenged schools that don't have the ability to govern themselves. I think yeah. the large part. And every conversation I've been in, folks from the head of the principals union in Philadelphia to principals in the room to teachers and parents and so on, voice a part of what you've said. This works if you've got a good principal in the school. It doesn't work if you don't. What are we going to do? And there's sort of two issues for principals. How do I learn, even if I already know my way around and I'm reasonably good, how do I learn to work in that universe, which is very different from the one I have worked in? That's a very immediate issue for the district. So how do we design professional development between now and September? And the other is, where do we find the people and provide the support to help them be successful? Because you cannot decentralize without having very capable school level leadership. Okay, we're, I think we've got three to go. It's Elaine, Sean, and Mike. Yeah, Mike. So, you know, thinking about models for, for turnaround, or models for good schools, let's just say. There are models in Philadelphia, and those models are schools where there is a lot of community support, where there are parents, community institutions that wrap their arms around that school and work with teachers and stability, I think. Like Stanton is a really great example of that. So that's not a school, and that's a school that succeeded and was successful despite the fact that the central administration is constantly jerking them around. And my experience in West Philadelphia was that 90% of what was wrong with that school was from the central administration. So I don't have any problem with autonomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think I think you're right that we don't have strong principles. 90% of the reason we don't have strong principles is because they've been jerked around for so many years. And they're not working, and they're working in this very top-down way. They don't know, you know, they, they've been, because they're treated like, you know, kind of, I don't know, beating, you know, beaten on. They beat on the people below them. So, I mean, I think that, you know, there is, I've been saying this over and over again, that there is a tremendous amount of resources and, and talent in this system, even now. I mean, even now that it's been hollowed out, and it's and it's not being listened to, and it's not being this either one of these, but certainly not the BCG one, is just looking at little boxes on it, you know, blue and green boxes on on a piece of paper. <coughs> to pick up on one piece of this, it's the talent in the district. BCG never anticipated that as carefully crafted a plan could emerge from within the district. Their assumption was there is no capacity in this organization. There aren't, nobody can do this. So when the plan emerged, they didn't know what the hell to do. And that's part of the reason the tension exists right now, because BCG figured they had a walk in this deal. Sean, we're up with you. I mean, I just, I maybe mean, this could also be my list, but isn't this an opportunity for the institution to create the space that would allow the institution to create the space to do some of the things that we've been talking about? I mean, I think there is a, a, a danger because the universities typically have not been accountable to communities, right? So we do what we want and we can declare victory and kind of walk away from it. Um, but this might be an opportunity for us to do the long-term work. I mean, if we can figure out how to create full-time events to cure cancer. Are you, are you volunteering to be in the center of this, Sean? Did I just I mean, say I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> But I, mean, I do think that the university could do this if we were going to be focused. And we create the space to do the right kinds of things. Agreed. Well, I will volunteer if Sean volunteers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I just want to say, it seems to me that there is a, an opportunity in a desperate strike to put something as an outlier solution. And I think one of the outliers, what we do know, it seems to me, from the research and the work over years and years of this, is that schools alone don't solve these issues. I don't know anyone who would say yes, no yes. Actually, school can just resolve all. We, we know that. So here we have lots of institutional support from different parts of the institution, from health, from our planning, and so forth. It seems to me if, you, if there's a chance to broker a deal, a tough situation is a good moment to try to broker a deal that they wouldn't normally agree to. And it seems to me if you could get three things, 
One is a time period. So let's, let's pick it a five or ten year period. Right? Make it cross sector. So then you get city municipal facilitation of cross sector collaboration that would be needed for cross sector collaboration to happen on the ground. That was my third one. <laughs> now I feel like that presidential candidate. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and what was his name anyway? <laughs> Uh, oh, space. I have a place. 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 Make it an actual place. In this geographic zone. Call it the West Philly zone or something. Let's put out a model of that. We don't have to recreate anything from New York. There are less expensive routes to doing that same kind of work. But it's what I think we already know from a lot of different fields. And I think if the, you know, is this a chance where uh, Billy might say, you know what? Yeah, we don't have that many other good solutions on the table. And if you guys are willing to belly up and say, yeah, we'll do this for a 10-year deal, but here's the deal, I don't know. I'd be willing to volunteer for that if others are. I lost Now, somewhere in the room are sign-up sheets. <laughs> There's one. I have one. There's one back there. Wait. I only say that to say, um, if I'm taking anything away from this meeting, is we had no idea whether one person would show up or three. Um, <laughs> So the fact that so many of you are here is really a testament both to your interest and commitment to trying to solve this problem. An indication that um, nobody came here to be a voyeur, that you know, one way or another if you can figure out how to be in this site, assuming you'll be in it. Um, and that this is a conversation that has to keep moving along and you know, Vivian and I are more than happy to keep it going. But we don't have to own it. This can go wherever you need it to go. I think, you know, this sort of ten USP Drexel, <coughs> COP, et cetera, conversation is one part of this, but it, um, I don't think any of us agrees that we want to do this without the help of a lot of other people. I think Mike's notion that you know this is a good time to think about what the ideal conditions would be and to make the time frame really long term, this 10-year idea rather than a three-year idea, we're going to do a performance contract, but let's be real about what the terms would be. And if you want us, we're going to write it in a way that we're going to make a community commitment, but we're going to say we can't make this happen like that. Um, so we let's can't back no. But also draw upon the resources that often function in the university <coughs> in very isolated ways. So it's also looking within the university's that we're talking about and figuring out what those resources are that can be brought to bear on the problem. One of the people I talked to a lot is Chris Forrest, who does community health at CHAP. And was it happened before he came here? And Chris' notion of how you do this stuff is to do what we're talking about and not worry about the money. Because if you create this kind of thing, the money will begin to aggregate around it. But you've got to get it started first and make it look like it's got some momentum behind it. And then the investors start to line up. And there will be the early investors and the get on board investors. But you shouldn't assume that. If you do this, there won't be resources that begin to be contributed around it. So again, thanks very much for being part of this. Um, we hope to keep this rolling.